Hi, everyone. I'm David Toll, publisher at Private Equity Career News. I want to welcome you to uh, today's webinar on uh, gearing up for the next deal boom. Um, you're, uh, you've come a little bit early, and we will start the formal program in about five minutes. But for getting here a little early, I wanted to reward you with some pro tips for how to make the most of this uh, go to webinar platform that we use. The first thing that you can do from your control panel is go to the handout section toward the bottom and download a copy of the slide presentation for today's program. Also, we have this really nifty report on industry practices in deal origination. It's based on a survey that we did uh, just this spring. You'll be among the first to see the, uh, the fresh results of, uh, of the survey. So avail yourself of that. Also on the control panel, there's a question feature. We'd love to get questions from you at any time during the program. So please, please uh, ask away. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do um, before we get started at 11 Eastern time is just go quickly and learn a little bit about what our panelists do in their spare time. Um, so we'll start with Jeff. Jeff, do you have a hidden talent or uh, hobby that you pursue in your spare time? Uh, I'm sorry to say, I, I don't think I have a hidden talent. Uh, in terms of hobbies and spare time, uh, hoping to get some spare time at the end of this summer and look forward to traveling. Um, I've been scuba diving uh, quite a bit. I think I've been to pretty much every major destination globally with the exception of Raja Ampat. So that's a that's a near term priority. Uh, that is pretty incredible. Jeff, what is Raja Ampat? Raja Ampat is the uh, most um, diverse and um, dense um, from a, a marine biological perspective region of the world within Indonesia uh, and forms what's referred to as a coral triangle comprised of Indonesia, Thailand, and other portions of the, the southern Indian Ocean. Okay, Jeff, you have set quite the high bar for the rest <laughs> of the panelists here. Thanks but we're... to uh, Colorado seem uh, horrible. <laughs> Yeah. But I guess we'll try. Uh, Don, hobby or hidden talent? Uh, sure. Well, when I'm when I'm not working um, or uh, or uh, coaching my uh, my daughters in in, uh, in lacrosse or other sports, um, I, I try to get out on the golf course or and and travel. Not quite like Jeff, uh, but I do try to get up into the mountains uh, or to the beach whenever whenever possible. So hopefully, hoping to do that a little later this summer. Okay, that sounds uh, that sounds good too. Uh, Nadine, nothing too uh, extraordinary, and certainly I wouldn't say I'm talented at either. But uh, golf and guitar are my hobbies, um, and uh, there are golf obviously here in the Northeast is seasonal, so uh, playing more of it now, and then guitar tends to go up in the winter months. So between those two things, I feel like I have a pretty good outlet. And Nadine, what's your uh, your high water mark, your best score in golf so far? Oh God, it's pretty embarrassing. Um, like a mid 80s, 85 is, is my best. Uh, not, that's, nothing too that's pretty good. I'm, I'm... Yeah, that's, uh, that's not bad at all. Um, and uh, Tom? What's uh, what's a hidden hidden talent or hobby that you pursue? You know, like most guys uh, or people in our industry, it's probably golf. I spend most of my time, uh, if I'm not uh, working, golfing. Okay, and uh, and what's your best uh, best score ever, Tom? Uh, I don't know. Just say it's a little better than Nadine. How about that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I'm okay. And uh, I guess I'll I'll bring things home with uh, my my not so hidden talent of uh, drawing cartoons. Uh, most of them related to uh, private equity, one one way or another. 
And um, yeah, for anyone can that's I, interested. Can I make a plug? Because I saw your book oh, and I saw the cartoons and they are one of the funniest things I've ever seen for people in our industry. They are great. Thank you, Tom. I do, I do appreciate that. A, a labor of love, to be sure. Yeah, if, any, if anybody is interested, you can get a copy of A Cartoon Lover's Guide to Private Equity uh, on Amazon. All the proceeds go to the Twigo Foundation, which helps uh, encourage women and minority to, minorities to pursue careers in finance. Okay, well, that brings us to the top of the hour, so I'd like to get the program started. So let's do that. Good morning and welcome to a special private equity career news webinar gearing up for the next deal boom. I'm David Toll. I'm the publisher of Private Equity Career News and I'm going to be your moderator for the balance of the program. I'd like to start out thanking our SBS by Bain and Company. They are an award-winning provider of actionable data and analytics for private equity firms trying to optimize their deal sourcing efforts. Uh, very grateful to SBS for uh, their support in this program. A few housekeeping announcements uh, before we get into it. First, a friendly reminder to any reporters on the program today that we are off the record Please reach out to the speakers individually for permission if you would like to use anything they say today in an article. Second, you can download a copy of today's slides from your control panel. Uh, just go to the handout section. You can also download a copy of the results of a 2023 survey that we just conducted of business development professionals, really good insights in the report on industry practices when it comes to deal origination. Third, later today I will send you a recording of the program or rather a link to a recording of the program. So there's no need to take extensive notes if you don't wish to. And finally, many of you asked great questions of our panelists when you registered. We will plan to address those questions during the discussion portion of the program. But please also feel free to ask questions at any time during the program. I'll be monitoring those. You can do that through the question feature on your control panel. Okay, I'm grateful to have four expert speakers today to guide you through our topic. Tom Aronson is Vice Chairman and Head of Originations at Chicago-based mid-market lender Monroe Capital. Private Credit has roared into popularity over the last couple of years, and Monroe Capital has been right at the center of the action. Nadim Malik is founder and CEO of New York City-based SBS by Bainey Company, our sponsor today. After the introductory portion, Nadim will present statistics describing the somewhat slow state of the M&A market. He'll also address the role that technology plays in helping deal originators see a higher percentage of relevant transactions. Don McDonough is Managing Director of Business Development at GTCR, uh, the legendary Chicago buyout firm, which is known for industry consolidations and which is celebrating a 40th anniversary. And finally, we have Jeff Pranitis. He is based in New York and is managing director in the Diversified Industries Investment Banking Group of uh, Stiefel Investment Banking. So let's uh, find out a little bit more about our speakers. I'd like them each in turn just to uh, tell us more about their firm and their role there. Tom, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Monroe Capital. Sure, thanks, David. As you said, I uh, run our originations at the front end of Monroe Capital. We started the firm in 2004. We have just over 17 billion of assets under management. We're, we're lenders, as you said, we're, we're really generalists. 
Uh, so we lend across multiple different sectors. However, we do have specializations and those would be technology, software, media, uh, healthcare, sports, some opportunistic and independent sponsor. So those would be more of our more specific sectors that we lend in and we can talk more about that later. We lend to both private equity sponsors as well as non-sponsor businesses. We like companies in the size range of, call it five to 50 of EBITDA, and our lending size or our hold size is typically anywhere from 50 to about $200 million. Thanks, Tom. I didn't realize you had a, a devoted effort to independent sponsors. How, how long have you had that? Well, we've uh, we've had a, uh, a a number of people that have equity background as part of our team, and over the years, I would say we've always looked to provide financing to uh, the independent sponsor sectors or individuals that prior in their prior lives might have worked for funds and decided to branch out on their own. Super. And Don, uh, tell us a little bit more about GTCR and your role there. Sure. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Um, as you mentioned, GTCR is a 40-plus-year-old uh, uh, private equity firm based in Chicago uh, with offices in New York and, and West Palm. Uh, myself, I'm based in, in New York. Uh, we invest out of two funds, a $2.2 billion strategic growth fund focused on the middle market and an $11.5 billion flagship fund focused on larger opportunities. Uh, across those two funds, uh, we invest anywhere from 50 million of equity to 200 uh, in flat in the strategic growth fund and 200 and above flagship. Those two uh, groups uh, invest in four sectors, uh, technology, media and telecom, financial services and technology, healthcare, and business and consumer services. And what I do is work with all these teams and the funds to generate new opportunities, angles on uh, new investments, add-ons for our portfolio companies and uh, and hopefully provide uh, angles and opportunities across all of it. We're a very proactive firm, so uh, keeps keeps me busy. No doubt. Thank you, Don. And Jeff, uh, tell us uh, more about Stiefel and what you do there. Sure. Stiefel Financial is a diversified financial advisory wealth management firm that's has been in existence for uh, going on in 130 years it's a it's a publicly listed company trading on the on the uh, new york stock exchange ticker sf roughly uh eight billion dollar market value um, broadly speaking um, as it pertains to the firm's efforts in in wealth management we have over 400 billion dollars of assets under management uh, Stiefel has a full-service investment banking practice, um, specifically focused on the middle market uh, with capabilities across debt, leverage, finance, and a, and a comprehensive private equity financial sponsor coverage effort. Um, my role in particular at Stiefel is within the diversified industries group, within the diversified services group, I am uh, responsible for the coverage of the business services sector. And that's an area where we've seen a significant degree of consolidation and a sector where there is a substantial amount of private equity activity. Super, thank you, Jeff. And let me now turn it over to Nadim Malik with uh, SBS by Bain and Company. Uh, Nadim will introduce himself and then go right into a presentation to share some uh, data and shed light on the current state of the market. Nadia? Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, my fellow panelists, for carving out the time to join us today. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Hope you're all having a nice summer and staying cool. Uh, at SPS by Bain & Company, we're continuing to do what we do best, which is helping our clients position themselves for relevant deal sourcing opportunities and business development strategies in the current market whatever that market might be, using data analytics, technology, and automation. As you're probably aware, deal activity in the PE and M&A world is down, and has been for the last year or so. Just anecdotally, based on my recent conversations with investors and bankers, it seems to have picked up, 
But is it truly showing signs of life and will it stay that way? On our panel today, we have a prominent middle market lender, iBanker, and PE professional. So we're getting the perspective of the key players involved in getting a deal across the finish line. I'm really looking forward to hearing that perspective. They're great at what they do and have been doing it for a while, each of them grappling with many of the same concerns as our audience. And before turning things over to them, I want to spend the next eight to 10 minutes walking through some slides to help frame our conversation, beginning with the one that you see up on your screen right now, which shows overall private equity and M&A deal activity. The dust is pretty much settled on 2022 full year data, and it looks like deal activity declined by just under 15% last year. And it's on track for a similar decline in 2023. 2021, as a reminder, was the first year since we started tracking the data that private equity represented the majority of M&A activity as compared to corporate or strategic buyers. That trend continued in 2022 and has remained intact so far in 2023 with PE activity consistently representing 53% of overall deal activity in the last two and a half years. I'd be curious to see what it would take and if this trend were to reverse. Moving on to the next slide, looking at quarterly closed deal activity, amazingly, quarterly deal counts are down every single quarter since Q4 2021. Looking at this chart, you can see the climb up the mountain starting from its base in Q2 2020 to the summit in Q4 2021 and then the downhill trend since then. Looking at Q2 2023, PE deal activity is down to 25% compared to Q2 last year, and corporate deal activity is down 30%. Those percentages will decrease as more closed deal data for Q2 2023 comes in. But looking at Q1 numbers, which is more fully baked, deal activity was down 25% year over year which is more or less in line with the Q2 decline. On the next slide, here you see the most active sectors for the first half of 2023 versus 2022, broken out between strategic and PE deals. Industrials has been the most active sector, but is down over 30% compared to last year, followed by technology and business services which are down 28% and 30% respectively. The sectors with the least decline year over year are healthcare and energy. PE has the edge over corporate buyers in all of the top five most active verticals, while the financial services, energy, and media and telecom sectors saw a higher share of strategic versus PE deals. Moving on to the next slide, this slide shows the most active sectors for PE activity only, comparing first half 2023 to first half 2022. All three of the top verticals, which are industrial technology and business services are down considerably for the year. The healthcare vertical saw the least decline year over year with activity levels almost equal to last year. And the energy sector actually came in with a slight increase. In terms of deal size, the smaller end of the market, which we categorize as 10 to 50 million in EV, represents the lion's share of all deal activity in terms of number of deals. The next slide shows a breakdown of larger transactions of a billion or greater into more granular size categories. This end of the market tends to get compressed in other charts due to, due to the prominence of smaller deals. Deal activity on this end of the market has declined for the first half period since 2021. And in 2023, the number of deals was slightly below the median for the last 10 years. Also worth noting is that on this end of the market for larger transactions, corporate M&A activity still outpaces PE deals on a relative basis. Moving on to the next slide. The trend of the buy and build and roll up strategies in private equity continues to increase, reaching 2.7 add ons for every platform in the first half of the year, 
after coming in at 2.6 add-ons last year. It'll be interesting to see how far this trend can continue. Will we surpass three add-ons for every buyout, maybe four? I think there's an argument that platform deal activity, which has been down, will pick up in the quarters ahead, especially as sponsors become more comfortable with exiting their portfolio companies. So we might see this trend taper off or even reverse temporarily. Having said that, more of our clients are getting involved, as Don mentioned, with their add-on deal sourcing strategy instead of leaving it just up to their management teams. Moving on to the next slide, breaking down sector activity by the four deal types we track, which are add-ons, buyouts, financings, which is what we call non-change of control transactions, and recaps. Financial services saw the greatest add-on activity relative to other deal types in the first half of the year, while financings continue to remain an important investment strategy in the technology sector. Having said that, add-ons comprise the biggest share, if not an outright majority, of all transaction types for most sectors, and are the key contributor behind PE activity, representing a higher share of overall M&A activity uh, compared to corporate buyers over the last two and a half years. Let's move on to the next slide. This is my new favorite slide, so I asked the team to update it for the first half of 2023. It shows the top 20 sell side advisors active in the first half of the year in terms of number of deals closed, then further breaking those deals down by size range. As deal activity has slowed down, I've heard some pretty crazy comments and rumors circulating about banks not closing any deals. Well, you can clearly see here that despite the decline in deals, there's still plenty of deals getting done by advisors. Moving on to the next slide, looking at private equity pipeline or deal log data, the median number of deals PE firms saw or logged perhaps more accurately was 211 in the second quarter, 2023, which is about 13% less than the same quarter year over year and only about 5% less than 2021 levels. While these numbers can't speak for quality, it does seem like a pretty robust quarter purely from the perspective of volume of deal flow. The big question is, will these deals actually close? Which we can address further on the next slide. We have a, a, a lot going on here. This is an analysis we publish annually in a series called The Science of Deal Sourcing 101. So let me just walk everyone through this. Uh, the columns represent median quarterly deal flow for PE firms, similar to the prior slide. The lines represent the percentage of those deals that were launched in that quarter that actually end up trading. And that's approximately seven months down the road on average, in case anyone's interested. If you're not familiar with this slide or any related content that we've shared, this percentage is probably going to come as a surprise. Indeed, only about 30 to 40% of deals that PE firms see and log end up trading at all to anyone. And take a look how that percentage dips during COVID. This should lend credibility to the data. We'd expect a higher than typical share of deals that launched just prior or early part of COVID to not end up completing. The percentage then bounces back sharply for deals brought to market in subsequent quarters as firms were hungry to get deals done, and then peaks in Q1 2021, only to dip again dramatically since late 2021 and early 2022. It's very possible that the percentage for these most recent quarters may get restated higher by the time we publish this again next year if deals are just taking longer than usual to close or, just, or are just on pause as opposed to being taken off the market altogether. Let's see, and I'd be curious to get some of our panelists' views on that as well. Finally, moving from a rather complex slide to something a little more straightforward, one of the features of our offering is our mobile app, which comes with each subscription. With it, you can pull up profiles of bankers, or PE professionals, or M&A lawyers, anyone in the private equity and M&A universe that you're trying to form relationships with. You can pull up their profiles right 
trading, view their transaction history or active portfolio in the case of PE contacts, their bios, and see if you have any deal connections in common, meaning if you know anyone they've done deals with. It also has geospatial awareness. So if you're in Chicago or Atlanta or LA and your lunch or meeting cancels, it'll show you who the closest folks are that are in your network and relevant for you. So if you know someone well and it's a great, oppor it's a great opportunity to fill that last minute cancellation with a touch point that could lead to your next deal. With that, I'd like to turn it back to our moderator, Mr. David Toll, and our panelists for our discussion and Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Nadim. And Nadim, I am getting a bit of an echo, but now it's gone away. Nadim, could you, um, uh, just uh, based on your years of experience with uh, Sutton Place Strategies, sort of um, comment on what the outlook for the second half of the year is in terms of deal volume and, and deal flow? Well, it's a really good question. I think the outlook is somewhat promising, David. You see um, the median deal flow numbers continue to rise. Now, you know, there could be a situation where two things. There could be a situation where that's a result of deals just being shopped more broadly and aggressively. So it's showing up in more pipelines and not an indication of actually more deals that will end up closing. Um, it could also be a situation where they don't end up trading for whatever reason, like we've seen in the past. That's usually due to something like COVID or you know, the Fed uh, increasing rates and the economic slowdown that roughly began a little bit over a year ago. But based on what we see right now and the lack of deal activity, the, the need for, you know, private equity and other participants and advisors in the M&A market to get deals done, you know, to end the year strong, um, I think the signs are there for the second half of the year uh, for a positive trends in terms of closed deal activity. Okay, thank you, Nadim. And I would like to ask the speakers to remain on mute if they're not, uh, if they're not speaking, um, and even during the discussion period, because I am, I am getting, <clears throat> am getting a slight echo, and I think that would, uh, that will help uh, prevent it. Okay, so before we uh, get into the discussion portion of the program, I do want to take advantage of the large audience that we have and get some market intelligence through a polling question. So let me tee that up for everybody. The first uh, polling question is, how do you expect the number of platform deals you, cl you closed this year to compare with last year? So I'm going to launch the poll, give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, again, um, how do you expect the number of platform deals you close in 2023 to compare with last year? Give you a couple more seconds to make your selections. Okay, so you can see uh, it's a fairly pessimistic uh, outlook um, down from last year is the most popular choice. About half of you expect uh, the number of platform deals you close this year to be down from last year, and another 30% um, expect it to be even with last year. So not too surprising given that we, uh, we are in a slower uh, M&A market. Okay, let's try one uh, final polling question. And a very related question is how do you expect the number of add-on deals uh, you close this year to compare with last year? So go ahead and Make your selections. How do you expect the number of add-on deals you close in 2023 to compare with last year? So there was a fair, 
fair amount of pessimism about platform deals. Let's see if that extends to uh, add-on deals as well. Give me another second. Okay. All right, so a little bit more optimism when it comes to add-on deals, but still, um, 64% or two thirds of you uh, expect the number to be either down from last year or even with last year. And then about a third of you expect uh, the number to be higher. Okay, so I wouldn't say there's a lot of uh, surprises there, just about what I would expect that I would have expected anyway. But let's turn to our panelists to, uh, to get their views. And I'd like to start with Jeff. Um, Jeff, tell us, tell us about the quality and quantity of deal flow that you see out there right now as an investment banker. And uh, we'd also be interested to hear your, your outlook for the rest of the year. Sure, happy to do so. So in short, quality's down and the quantity of transaction volume is down. And, and there are a few reasons behind that. Um, we've seen those in the slides that have just been presented. There was a record level of monetizations in 2021, and those transactions in many cases were done at record valuation levels. So broadly speaking, those sponsors and those businesses are focused on execution of their, their new strategies. They're still in early stages of their investment horizons, and um, that's in part influencing what we're, we're seeing in the market. Uh, the, the notable um, factor that's influencing supply and demand from a deal perspective is that those sponsors who monetized in 2021 um, did so in a manner which was um, very effective in positioning them for subsequent fundraises. And we've seen sponsors raise new funds, raise larger funds than they've managed previously. And as a result, they're now seeking to deploy that capital. So there's a large number of sponsors pursuing fewer assets. And, and in general, broadly speaking, that's created an imbalance in the supply and demand for investment opportunities that would normally drive valuations higher. Uh, but in, in most cases, we're seeing buyers take a more cautious approach, um, partially influenced by constraints in the market related to the availability of debt capital, the cost of debt capital, uh, and broader macroeconomic concerns. But I think there are a number of reasons to be optimistic about the remainder of 2023 and the, the market environment that's likely to evolve as we get into 2024. Um, so first, um, the debt markets are showing signs of improvement. The markets are showing um, activity in levels in broader portions of uh, in particular the debt capital markets and extending into the syndicated loan sector there's a greater degree of liquidity beginning to develop the perceived risks associated with a major economic downturn um, appear to be subsiding and it appears that the fed is at the end or approaching the end of a tightening cycle so i, I think this has three potential outcomes on a near-term basis and an intermediate-term basis for the market. So the first is that um, there's likely to be a reduction in the level of risk aversion among buyers, which we see at a very heightened level today. And as a result, as they approach new opportunities to deploy capital, uh, they may be in a position to do so with a greater degree of conviction. Those buyers are likely to have better access to capital albeit that, that access to capital is still going to be more expensive than it had been in preceding years. But what I, what I think is noteworthy about the current economic environment and what we can expect to see coming into the end of the year is that there will be businesses that have demonstrated their ability to withstand challenging economic environments uh, and challenging operational environments. These are companies that have demonstrated the ability to manage through high inflationary periods to address challenging labor-related constraints 
and to address challenging supply chain issues. So they've proven themselves as strong operators. And I think that's going to bring conviction to the buyer universe and position them to be more assertive, more aggressive in ascribing values to businesses that may approach the levels that we've seen previously. And accordingly, that has the potential to bring more sellers to the market and help resolve the supply and demand imbalance that I mentioned at the, the earlier portion of my, my uh, discussion points. Um, that's, that's a great answer, Jeff, and um, appreciate your uh, bringing such an analytical approach to it. So it sounds like we could be um, at a real turning point and uh, uh, there's a lot of reason for optimism for uh, for the next 18 months or so. Tom, I want to get uh, your view, whether you see things similarly or have a different perspective. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would say uh, we're pretty similar in our view, and I, I think Nadim's presentation was kind of spot on of, of what we're seeing at Monroe. Monroe we have a rather large origination team uh, for the industry. We have you know 20 plus originators that are out and about and meeting with many of our referral sources, whether they be uh, investment bankers or private equity firms, or as I mentioned, independent sponsors. So as a result of that, our deal flow is up. It's up pretty dramatically. So we're we're up about 30% of the uh, you know quantity of deals, but I would agree with uh, the others on the panel that uh, the quality is not quite there. And, uh, you know, like everyone's looking to do deals. Uh, everyone wants to do deals, but for a lot of the reasons that were previously discussed, uh, from a debt perspective, you know, we have a little bit more scrutiny in the types of deals that we're, you know, willing to provide uh, debt to, meaning, you know, obviously we're, we're all looking at inflation numbers, we're, we're dependent, we're looking at the likelihood of a soft landing versus a you know a steep recession, and because of that, we're much more focused on some of the fundamentals of a business, meaning fixed charge coverage, leverage, and things of that. So, I would agree with what Nadim said. You know that the number, which is um, very important, what number of deals will get done. So, um, overall, though, quantity is up, but quality is down mainly because of some of the economic factors that we take into account when evaluating the level of debt that we're going to put on a uh, on a company okay thank you uh, thank you tom and don um i couldn't help noticing that you've uh, G at gtcr have actually done a couple of deals just within the last uh, the last couple of weeks so uh, obviously you're you're an active buyer right now, but I want to hear um, uh, just in general what what you're seeing in terms of deal flow, quantity, quality, and your and your outlook for the rest of the year. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'd say you know constant you know, consistent themes with what the other panelists have seen that over the last you know, nine to twelve months, quality and quantity have been down. I think the flavor of the deal flow that we've seen largely has skewed smaller and lower lower, lower quality. Um, and that's begun to change over the last several months. I think my view over the, for the rest of the year is that we'll see, I wouldn't necessarily call it a turning point as much as I'd see somewhat of a capitulation around from sellers and an increase overall in deal flow as we move through the year. Um, the the kind, kinds of deals that we're seeing uh, tend to be you know, larger, more situational opportunities more recently than the one like the ones that we've announced. Uh, in some cases, partnering with corporates uh, and, and and other sponsors, uh, and and where interest rates have come into play. Uh, and then uh, again, more founder founder based businesses that are of higher quality, and as those businesses have gained better conviction in their year end performance, uh, then uh, you know they're they're more willing to come to market. So the, the the part of the market that's been more absent has been the private equity sellers, and I think there's a large. If you ask most of the advisors that we talk to, the their their deal pipelines are fairly deep um, and waiting for an opportunity to go to market when they have a little more certainty of of uh, either performance or conviction around valuation uh, in the broader market. But I, I think I'd expect that 
you know, barring some uh, you know, outside influence, uh, we'll begin to, we've probably seen the bottom as far as deal flow is concerned. And my expectation is that deal flow will tick up from month to month as we move through through the year, uh, but maybe not a watershed turnaround in a, uh, you know, a, 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 a call it a tsunami of deal flow at any one moment. And John, are you a buyer right now? Uh, I see that you are, so I, th I think the answer is yes. <laughs> but are, uh, are you an excited buyer? Maybe I'll ask that, or a seller right now? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, as, as I think you've seen um, some of our announcements and, and hopefully some of the things that we have lined up in the not too distant future, uh, we, we are a buyer. Um, certainly that can be se sector specific. Um, you know, we, you know, the firm uh, had a, 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 a lot of exits and realizations in 2020 and 2021, and we're fortunate to have uh, two, uh, two new funds with a lot of dry powder that we're looking to deploy. Um, I think we're seeing terrific opportunities with our executive uh, and leader strategy initiatives in, in all of our sectors um, and have a great deal of flexibility in how we deploy that capital. So, uh, you know, we're eager to put it to work and, and are trying to lean into the market. Um, you know, the challenge is, um, you know, finding that, that equilibrium with the sellers. Don, what's it gonna take to get more high quality deal flow coming? What's, what's keeping them on the sidelines right now? Well, I think certainly what you're seeing in the debt markets and the relative Im and that impact evaluation um, could keep some sellers on, on, the, uh, on the sidelines. Um, but I think a lot of it is also, again, that, that conviction. I don't think from a, for a large number of you know, private equity sellers, uh, they have a valuation that they need to hit, whether that's to certainly provide liquidity to their LPs and raise new funds. And so at some point, the, the wheel has got to start, start turning. Um, but to a large degree, you know, they, with that uncertainty in the market, they don't want to be the first one through the door uh, without, the, uh, without a safety net in, in any kind of process. So I think being able to provide that kind of conviction that there's interest and that there is a, a good valuation around businesses prior to a process or um, you know, early on in a process will help give advisors and the business owners that kind of conviction that they're not going to end up in a uh, in a broken situation because they don't get what they they expect. So giving clarity to the sellers and being um, uh, being focused in your sectors so that you have a good handle on what the what the opportunities that are right for you and uh, and the executives and investors at your at your, uh, at your firm. Okay, thanks, Don. And let's um, I'd like to to turn to talking about specific uh, industries and subsectors. Uh, we saw some great data from SBS uh, earlier on the continued popularity of deals in broad uh, industries like industrials, uh, technology, business services, and healthcare. But I'd like our panelists to maybe drill down a little deeper and talk about some interesting subsectors that they see uh, heating up with private equity sponsors right now. And... Um, and uh, and talk about why uh, why that is. So uh, Tom, why don't we uh, why don't we start with you this time? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, Nadim again uh, nailed the sectors that uh, we've seen and focused on. I would say the uh, if you drill down a little bit in technology, obviously tech enabled services, recurring revenue has uh, has been a big focus for us. Although valuations in that sector have come down, still the uh, the financing requests are still attractive. We still like our loan to values, which are usually pretty low. We like the uh, desire for uh, many of these uh, companies to convert to now profit uh, generating versus, uh, you know, kind of rev revenue generating. So the appetite for some of our recurring revenue deals uh, or software deals is uh, is is still there. Despite you know what we're hearing at broad level in the market that the valuations are coming down from a credit perspective, that's still good. Of course, healthcare, uh, all the services, different services within healthcare have been strong for us. Uh, continues to be a mainstay for uh, for Monroe. We like the uh, non-cyclicality of that sector and still look to um, 
you know, really finance in that sector. There's consistent demand. It's non-cyclical. So we have uh, continued to like healthcare. And then business services has, has picked up uh, um, really, um, if you look at experiential type companies, uh, companies that focus around, you know, all the general, uh, you know, kind of business service sectors have been really strong for us. So I would say those three, we're not as heavy in the industrials. I think Nadine po pointed that out as uh, maybe uh, one of the top sectors that um, we haven't seen that, the same type of activity that um, was outlined, but, you know, certainly uh, if those companies are performing good credit structure, good sectors, um, we'll, we'll obviously um, finance those as well. Okay, thanks, Tom. And business services, uh, certainly, um, Jeff, something that, uh, that you're an expert in, and maybe you could take us uh, even a little further down um, in, uh, in, into business services and talk about some specific, maybe uh, under the radar areas that, uh, that are heating up. Sure, hey, happy to do so. So we're seeing two major themes. And the, the first is one that I think is broadly focused on businesses and business models that have proven uh, their economic resilience. And one of the best examples that I could cite in, in that area would be the fire and security services sector. So when we think about that more broadly, uh, the fire sector is regulatory driven demand independent of the overall economic environment. Um, on the security side, these are businesses for the most part, particular uh, on the commercial side that are um, ones that have contractually recurring revenue models. Um, literally in the commercial market, there's never been a year over year decline in spend for commercial security alarm um, monitoring. So in, we, we've gone into more detailed um, analyses related to those portions of the market and, and have looked at their performance over the last two major economic downturns. So the financial crisis, the dot-com area, and found that um, in both cases, those sectors grew through those market downturns at rates ranging from 2 to 4%. And there was a peak to trough variation pertaining to um, the revenue fluctuations. But what we noted in particular was rapid recovery of, of those revenue levels because the spending in those areas can be deferred but isn't typically deferred on a long-term basis. And even when it's being deferred, it's being partially offset and mitigated by spending related to uh, services that's necessary to maintain existing infrastructure. So I think that in part explains some of the demand driving um, interest related to economically resilient sectors and fire and security in particular. The, the second major theme that we see in business services is an, an emphasis and a focus on fragmented markets, large scale markets that represent consolidation opportunities, markets that are largely characterized by local operators where there's an opportunity to establish a consolidation platform and, and begin to build that platform through add-on acquisitions. And we've seen that being done over the past several years very effectively in the HVAC market, in the landscaping market. Some of the subsectors where uh, we're beginning to see more activity in a in a, um, a number of efforts underway to replicate those strategies would be the commercial roofing market, the residential roofing market, gate services, generator services, and renovation restoration more broadly. So those are sectors that are in earlier stages of consolidation, sectors that haven't necessarily reached the valuation levels that we've seen in HVAC as, a, as an example, and ones where we see sponsors um, preparing to deploy meaningful amounts of capital on a near-term basis. Okay, uh, that was that was great, Jeff. I appreciate that. And Don, let's uh, let's turn to you. I know I've been hinting at a couple of the deals that you've done recently. I hope you won't mind my uh, just uh, disclosing, since you have press releases out that you that you re uh, just recently bought. Uh, a supply chain uh, management software company that looks very interesting called Once For All. Yeah. And uh, you also bought a payment processing company called WorldPay, um, which also, uh, I don't, uh, that, I'm optimistic for you there too. They both look like great deals. Um, 
but tell us maybe why you're why you're excited about the areas that those companies play in and and any other uh, areas that you'd like to talk sure. about. Now look, we're 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 excited about those those deals. Certainly, um, they they have yet to close, but have been announced. And and in 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 those cases, I think you're seeing some of the themes that uh, the panelists have talked about. And I, I would agree where uh, where you're seeing uh, you know recurring predictable revenue, the convergence of technology, uh, advances in data and analytics, and 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 that fragmentation and opportunity for add-ons is. You know, that where I think you're seeing a, a lot of activity um, and perhaps a little more resiliency in, in, in valuations. You know, the deals that we've been able to sign um, all, you know, in, in different ways uh, have, have some of those opportunities and, and characteristics. Um, I, you know, I would say um, all of them are areas that we have spent, you know, my, my, my transaction team partners have spent a significant amount of time an effort not just with those businesses, but um, in the sectors, and have you know, clear ideas on um, not just how to get a transaction done. You know, world pay transaction is a, a highly complex, uh, you know, global deal uh, with uh, significant need, you know, uh, you know, debt requirements and operational requirements and executive partnerships and and corporate partnerships. So, a lot of things converging there. Um, you know, once for all, uh, get a different type of business based in Europe um, with uh, a terrific opportunity not only to build their base in Europe, but but more globally. Um, and so, um, again, I'd echo some of the some of the characteristics of the other that, that that Jeff and Tom uh, have have mentioned. Um, and and then where we're where we're focusing. I mean, other areas in addition to some of the residential services and industrial services and technology and, and subscription services. We're seeing opportunities in distribution, supply chain, marketing technology, services, testing, data and analytics. And I think in those opportunities, we're seeing uh, not just one avenue for growth and opportunity investment, but but multiple avenues. So we're we're excited about those, and and um, it obviously all comes down to operating and and uh, executing around our plan. But we're 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 really excited about. Okay, thanks, Don. And I wanted to turn back uh, to our investment banker on the panel, Jeff. Um, and Jeff, earlier you were kind of sketching broadly the M&A market and saying plenty of dry powder, plenty of funds being raised, and GTCR, Don mentioned, has just uh, just raised a couple of big new funds. Um, so uh, demand is there. Uh, the problem right now is the supply is down. Uh, but you're talking to potential sellers all the time. So Jeff, I'm wondering, what are you hearing from them? Why aren't they ready to come to market uh, just yet? And what's what's it going to take to uh, to twist their arm? So we we are in in regular dialogue with with business owners, with financial sponsors, discussing all of the topics to which you referred. Um, but first, our our objective is to align our interests and position ourselves as um, relationships um, whereby we're focused on becoming um, a uh, strategic advisor on a long-term basis. So we don't necessarily direct our clients to um, transact in any given direction. Um, our, our objective is really to share with our clients our perspectives um, on the market and, and our views on their business and provide them the data uh, and, and the insights that will assist them with formulating their own views and making their own decisions pertaining to how and when they want to transact. Um, but as it pertains to companies that are thinking about approaching the, uh, the uh, M&A market in the current environment, there, there are a number of factors on, on which we would typically focus ourselves. One is, um, is, the, is the business prepared? for a transaction. And, and that is as, as basic and, and as fundamental as assessing the recent performance of the company. Um, but in a, at a more granular level, um, analyzing the, the data that's available pertaining to the company, pertaining to its operational metrics and its KPIs, is it sufficient to support diligence? And then we think more broadly about uh, the nature of their operating environment. Are there major contract renewals that are pending are there patent expirations? Are there outstanding RFPs related to new projects that represent large-scale potential new opportunities? Are there 
pending acquisitions, is the management team prepared? Um, are there holes in the management team? And what is the status of any major strategic initiatives that those businesses have underway? And, and we test our clients and we vet the, the responses and the data that they pr provide in, in response to those inquiries um, in a way that's um, very rigorous and in a, in a manner which is um, identical to that which they would expect to see, they should expect to see from buyers when they actually do enter a process. Then we think more broadly, what is the, the longer term company strategy? What is uh, the, the attractiveness of the new markets into which they intend to expand? Are there pe uh, pending product rollouts? Um, and we, we combine all those, those views and perspectives with proprietary market intelligence. So we think about um, transactions with which we've been involved, transactions that we've seen in the market. So who are the motivated buyers, the runner-up buyers in recent processes, and at what valuation levels were those buyers prepared to transact? Uh, what were their diligence priorities and what factors uh, prevented them from prevailing in a process? So those are, those are some of the most important topics that we would cover with our clients. Then there are additional considerations that would be um, client-specific, company-specific. Are there fund expirations that need to be considered? Is there a sole proprietorship where the owner is looking to exit or retire? Are there tax-related considerations, estate planning considerations, debt maturities? So um, it's a lot to think about, and it's customized for every situation. But our, our goal longer term is is to position ourselves as the advisor that can assist clients with working through those considerations and making the decisions that were uh, going to be in the best interest of, of themselves and, and the constituents for which they're responsible. And Jeff, we have a follow-up question for you from the audience. Um, going back to an earlier uh, question, this, uh, th this attendee says, I, I agree with the sustained year-over-year -year growth in commercial security and fire monitoring, but some say that the sector is becoming more commoditized. Uh, do you agree with that? And do you feel like there's still, you know, quite a bit of opportunity, white space to be grabbed in uh, in that fragmented center, sector? So I'll, I'll address that in two components because there are some distinctions between fire and security. Fire, to a large degree, can be characterized as a, a more basic fundamental service um, with a lesser degree of technology content. And there, there are initiatives underway that may modify that, that landscape and operating environment. But what's important to consider is that um, it's code-driven, it's regulatory-driven. The demand and the need for those solutions is not going to change. So it's important to think about the growth opportunity from an investment perspective. There's going to be some degree of an organic growth opportunity, but it's likely to be single digit unless there's an operator that is uniquely positioned with national accounts or some type of technology that moves away from um, more commoditized um, labor intensive areas. Um, the security market's a bit different. Um, that's going to be a market that evolves and adopts new technology as there are opportunities to um, deploy solutions that produce returns on investment and create um, an environment whereby there's a greater degree of business intelligence derived from the use of those technologies. So I, I don't see security in, in areas such as access control, as an example, as being commoditized. I see it as an area where there's an investment opportunity and one on which large scale existing strategics are focused and that's going to create existing um, opportunities for uh, existing sponsors focused on the sector to deploy capital as well. Okay yeah sounds like plenty of opportunities still left in that uh, that space. Let's um, let's turn to the heart of the uh, topic of, uh, of this whole program which is how to gear up for deal boom. And I want to get into some of the deal <laughs> strategies that are working uh, right now and what's not working right now and, uh, and basically what, um, what's going to be working during this, uh, this, coming, this coming deal boom. So Don, let's, uh, let's, talk, let's, uh, let's turn to you. What, what deal sourcing strategies are working best for you right now and what's, uh, what's no longer really, really doing it? Yeah, 
Um, thanks. You know, and I think we've we've alluded to some of this uh, already, but but I think it's it's just you know critical to be uh, you know proactive in all of your sectors. The days of waiting for opportunities to arrive in your inbox and in in, in generalities of sectors that you think you you may have interest in. To, to then decide whether you want to pursue an opportunity or are, are gone. So the more that uh, you can, your the investment teams and your business development efforts are engaging in uh, subsectors that they have high, you know, high interest, um, can provide con conviction, can, can provide angles, and oftentimes knowledge around the businesses and in some cases ownership coming into uh, an, an opportunity. Uh, the, the, the better. Um, so you know, I think business development professionals need to be, you know, I guess always by definition front footed and, and proactive in all their markets. But I think uh, you as a, as firms, you need to differentiate yourselves as early as possible. And, and so uh, whether that's work uh, direct to company prior to process, direct to executives, understanding the dynamics of those sectors and, and getting to those companies uh, oftentimes, you know, conjunction with with the advisors that you're working with, and uh, so so that uh, you know, I think you, there's no there's no no such thing as really as a proprietary opportunity, but you can be better prepared. You can better provide speed at the speed and conviction that are going to be necessary to get a deal done. And so those are some of the things we're working with, and I work across uh, all all four of our industry teams and and uh, and, and funds to and, and two funds to to do just that. How do we get better access earlier, um, and to be able to provide that kind of conviction and, and uh, you know, speed to close? Don, you did say you reached out directly to um, to uh, to business owners, directly to companies. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what what um, what are some uh, tips uh, there that you have for our audience to make make those sure that those initial contacts, those initial calls go well and set the stage for a relationship with that company. Yeah, well, I, I think you need to be there with, with a purpose. Um, you're hoping to be able to, um, you know, as far as access is concerned, uh, you're not on a fishing expedition. You're there because, you know, for a specific reason, you like what they're doing, you like the management team, you like their growth prospects. Um, you know, ideally, you're you're uh, you know getting that warm introduction, whether it's through the right right advisor like like Jeff or or you know any of his better or or through other other connections you might have, and then continue to foster that through whatever third parties are are important to that company. So um, I think that's going to be to be able to convince that 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 owner or that business uh, you know that CEO that you can be a differentiated partner for that. Uh, for that business going forward, and you have a genuine interest and in angles around how to help them get their get to take their company to the next level. Um, and uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have a, a large group of of uh, investment partners that are embedded in their sectors all the time, and 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 consistently not only staying on on abreast of developments, but uh, you know, new opportunities to um, to for, for growth. Uh, as well as you know, operational uh, opportunities and, and acquisitions as we might move forward. So, being able to convey that uh, to the business owner and to uh, the management team, I think, is is important. Uh, so, the days of you know, fishing expeditions are, are are becoming tougher and tougher. Being being general, you need to be be there with a purpose. <laughs> okay, no more fishing. Um, that sounds like good advice, and uh, we're. We want more advice from Jeff on this question because uh, once the market starts heating up again and everyone gets busy, um, you know it's going to be tough uh, getting on Jeff's radar, staying on Jeff's radar. So Jeff, what's what's your advice to sponsors out there that do not want to miss a great deal that um, that you're representing, whether it's a sale of a company or a financing opportunity? What's uh, what should they be doing? I think it's important that, broadly speaking, regardless of the status of the economic cycle, that sponsors are doing work on a proactive basis, identifying sectors that are priorities for them from a, a broader investment thesis view, um, that they're building relationships and, and building their networks of potential board members, advisors, and um, executives, 
and that they are uh, developing the relationships with um, target companies and the management teams of target companies. Uh, getting early support from their investment committees, committees to spend time, deploy resources with the objective of pursuing specific sectors and specific companies in those sectors aggressively when those opportunities become available. Because in a, in a stronger market, processes are going to move faster, they're going to be more competitive, and investment committees will typically have a lesser degree of support for situations where there hasn't been historical dialogue, historical interaction, or where the investment team doesn't have some type of angle that they could pursue when an asset becomes available. So this is uh, in particular the type of market environment where those efforts are going to be especially valuable and ones that are likely to yield um, attractive returns in the future. Right. Uh, super advice. And um, let's turn to another question from a registrant, which came when they uh, signed up for the program. And that is, what is the outlook for independent sponsors over the next five to seven years? Do you expect them to remain competitive for deals? And just as a side note, uh, yesterday, Private Equity Career News, my newsletter, broke the story that a managing director at Audax Group, a big mid-market buyout firm up in Boston, uh, had left to set up his own uh, independent sponsor uh, called Point A Capital. And I spoke to um, the, uh, the, the founder of the company yesterday, Ryan Bruhlman, and he, he said that, um, you know, if it were five, 10 years ago, he probably would not have jumped, <coughs> have jumped ship. <clears throat> he would have waited till he was further in his career. He's still a very young guy. Um, but he said the development, just this in incredible rapid development in the independent sponsor ecosystem um, convinced him that now is the time and he could develop a track record doing deals on a deal by deal basis with the idea of maybe down the road um, raising a committed fund. So I thought that was very interesting. And with that as a backdrop, Tom, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your views on the overall growth of the independent sponsor market and how, uh, how competitive you think it will be in the years ahead. Sure. Well, listen, uh, 15 years ago, talk, uh, or so, um, independent sponsor was another way for to define someone who couldn't get a job in the private equity world. That would be, you know, somebody who just said, I can't get a job. I want to be a private equity business. Uh, so I'm just going to call myself an independent sponsor. And they really didn't come to the table with any value add. If you fast forward 15 years, now the industry is really uh, filled with executives that have tremendous amount of experience that have worked for funds that have um, a lot of connections may have industry specific knowledge and maybe uh, don't feel like they want to sign up for another five to seven years with a fund but they still want to um, be in the deal business so you and what we have found are a lot more experienced individuals that are coming to the table, maybe they don't have a fund behind them, but they do have many connections to raise money. They usually have been in the private equity world. They have sources of capital, whether those be family offices or uh, maybe some other institutional capital that they've worked with in the past that no longer wants to uh, put money up in a dedicated fund, but maybe wants to look at it on a deal-to-deal -deal basis. So the whole independent sponsor um, network has evolved and it's become a much more uh, reputable, I would say, way to get a deal done. Years ago, you know, I know I talked to many investment bankers when we were looking at maybe potential financing and they would say, you know, they're the last resort. We are really going to turn this company over if we sell it to someone who has a track record in the fund business. And that's what we're looking at. And so then we'd look at the deal and say, you know what? If this independent sponsor won it, it's probably because no one else wanted that asset. That again has changed our view such that at Monroe, 
we do have a sector that's dedicated solely to independent sponsors whereby we will put equity alongside our debt. We're not looking to be the majority. We never are. We're looking to be a minority. So if a independent sponsor is able to raise 70%, 80% of the capital or equity needed, then we'll come along if we like the deal and we'll do our debt, but we'll also put additional money in to get them over the hump. So we have the right, call it balance sheet, cap structure when we come out of the blocks. So all of that together really has the arrow pointing up and to the right for the independent sponsor sector. And we see more and more deals getting done, uh, especially in our portfolio, back in some really seasoned and quality uh, professionals that have experience and really have good opportunity for growth with particular companies. Thank you, Tom. That is uh, that is really neat. What's going on there, and uh, it reminds me how you know we've always seen lenders and investment bankers to some extent actually commit some capital to private equity funds over the years uh, for a variety of reasons, and now you're saying you're actually um, investing alongside of independent sponsors um, in their deals to help them, you know, get to uh, get uh, uh, to the equity levels that they'd want. And um, yeah, it's just uh, really neat what's going on out there. So let's, um, uh, well, no, uh, certainly no webinar on any business topic would be complete without uh, some discussion of artificial intelligence. So, so let's, uh, let's do that now and turn to Nadim to talk about uh, just kind of where he sees artificial intelligence playing a role in deal origination in uh, right now and, and maybe in, the, in over the next few years. Thanks, David. I think it's a really good question. It's an important topic. It's a topic that can, that's vast and ever changing and, and new, new areas and experts coming in and in it. And this is where it's a real benefit to be part of Bain, our parent, the consulting firm. You know, they formed a strategic partnership with OpenAI uh, to stay on the cutting edge of generative AI and how it can be applied for its clients. Um, in terms of, you know, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I was asked the question often about predictive analytics and how that's going to change. And certainly that's important as well. Now you're right. You know, this, this concept of AI and specifically generative AI is uh, capturing everyone's imagination. And I think it's, very important, you know, and to answer, the best way I could think of answering this question is the, the, the saying that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And there's no, there's no script on what generative AI can do for your business, how it can improve. I think it's up to CEOs and leaders of each organization to understand it, do their research. The application is going to vary from industry to industry. Chat GPT is only one you know, sub-component of generative AI, but it's getting a lot of uh, attention. Um, it's having a huge impact on the law industry, for example, and quickly because anytime or in any business where you have to create large amounts or large volumes of text content, I think it's going to be a real game changer. And uh, there's many industries where you can think where that's at least a small or a major component of their business. And we're looking at it, how it can improve our business, you know, especially in our data collection. Anytime there's uh, an auto, uh, there's a large volume of repetitive tests, uh, generative AI can automate that um, and create the results that you're looking to. Uh, we're looking at it in ways that we can improve our tech enablement, how we can bring value to our clients in terms of deal sourcing. Uh, so this is, it's very new, it's very nascent, but it, this is, uh, it's very important. So I'm glad the question came up. Uh, and I think it's uh, just the onus on, on the leaders of all organizations to figure out, like, this is, this is amazing. And uh, how, what is it, which is, it's, it is fairly complex, unless you're in the technology industry, and uh, get the information and, and, and just have the creative brainstorming sessions internally to figure out, okay, how, what, how can I improve my internal processes and business, and how can I improve the product and value or service that I'm bringing to our clients? And 
we're certainly in the middle of all that right now. Okay, thanks, thanks, Nadine. So we've got about five minutes left, and I want to end with a, a lightning round question. I want each of my panelists to take no more than a minute uh, to uh, to respond. Uh, we'll go in the order of Tom, Don, Jeff, and Nadim. And I'm looking for a favorite uh, portfolio company, a favorite client, perhaps in the case of Jeff, uh, a favorite sector, um, and what you're excited about. Uh, Tom, let's let's start with you. Uh, well, I would say you know today we you know we do a broad. I told you we were generalists. I mean, what's really important to us is the management team in today's uh, market as they change. How strong is the management team? How good is, you know, what's the capital structure? And then obviously the industry, that's very important. Some of the more specifics, we've been, you know, dominant in the car wash uh, industry. We've, we've liked that business services. I mentioned there's uh, engineering services, businesses. I think Jeff mentioned HVAC, landscaping. Uh, so we're, we like um, all of those businesses, but ultimately we're looking at uh, businesses that we feel are uh, not quite as cyclical and are, you know, resistant uh, to maybe a recession. Okay, thanks, Tom. And Don, a favorite uh, fa favorite portfolio company of yours? Sure. This is a this is a tough one. I don't want to play play favorites, and we're seeing a lot of a lot of exciting things across our portfolio. But I'll give a couple of examples, and one we've mentioned already today uh, is is WorldPay. Certainly, our, our uh, the largest transaction our firm has ever ever completed, and and one in an exciting space in financial technology and payments uh, on a global level. I think what we uh, you know we see there is is not only uh, strong organic growth in in the uh, in the space, but also opportunities for you know new technologies, better operations, and improved leadership, and as well as M and A. So a lot of great avenues for growth there. Um, as well as you know, partnership with the former parent, and, uh, and so a lot of really exciting dynamics there in our, our flagship fund. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, uh, another business that we're we're excited about among many in our strategic growth fund is uh, is it plays some of the trends that Jeff was talking about. A company called Sensky Services, and that's a lawn care uh, pest control tree service business that's uh, you know highly repetitive. Highly fragmented space. Uh, we've got great leadership and and uh, uh, a lot of again multiple avenues for growth there too. So uh, two different sectors, uh, two different flavors and size of deals, and uh, but a lot of the same uh, uh, same dynamics there, I suppose. Uh, so we're we're excited about both those, but I don't want to get in trouble with any of our other portfolio companies. So uh, we're we're excited across the board. Uh, very cool. And Jeff, uh, maybe a, a particular client that um, under the radar, but really exciting business or business model. Sure, I, I can give you two examples. Um, the the first is uh, Invera Systems, which is a managed access control business. It's effectively a disruptive business model that's replacing or displacing the security guard industry with technology enabled solutions. So they're they're offering. Uh, through technology, access control capabilities that are offered at a 75% discount to the cost of security guards. They've grown at a double-digit rate on a, on a compounded basis over the past decade, and over that time period, they've seen 100% revenue retention. That is a portfolio company of WinPoint Partners. The other business that I'll reference in uh, one of the, the, the priority markets on which sponsors are focused today is ATI Restoration. Uh, ATI is a TSG consumer portfolio company. Um, it is an emerging large-scale operator in renovation and restoration. They were a featured presenter at Stiefel's Cross-Sector Insight concert, uh, Conference last month. Their C CEO is Dave Carpenter. He's also a senior advisor to Stiefel's Investment Banking Division. What we like about this business is that it's a consolidation platform with a large pipeline of attractive proprietary acquisitions. And at the same time, it's proven its ability to grow organically and grow in a manner which has insulated the business from exposure to one-time weather events 
um, and a business that has the underlying data to substantiate the predictability and recurring nature of its revenue streams. Thanks, Jeff. You said the CEO's name is David Carpenter. I have to say that's that's a very big surprise that he would go into the restoration business. But um, let's uh, let's finish up with uh, Nadim. We'll give you the final word on our program today. Thanks, David. In terms of business model, uh, piggy piggyback on what others are saying. I'm I'm living it day to day as a recurring revenue predictable um, business, revenue business model with high retention rates. Especially in these types of markets, I just they're just great businesses, and I feel very uh, fortunate to have built a great team and and to you know to be able to run that kind of business. And you really see it pay off in these types of markets. Uh, in terms of favorite clients, you know, since starting the company in '09, over the last 14 years, we've worked with hundreds of firms, thousands of individuals. But you gave me an easy one because two of the favorite people that I've had a chance to work with over that time are on this call with Tom and Don. So you gave me a layup there, David. So I'll, I'll end with that one. All right. Um, well, we'll call it a program and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming, all of our attendees. I'd like to thank our sponsor, SBS by Bain and Company for making the webinar possible. And most of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, our speakers rather, for doing such a great job with the program. Tom Aronson of Monroe Capital, Don McNanup of GTCR, and Jeff Pernitis of Stiefel. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.